originally when I started, Los Angeles was very horizontal and extroverted. And today, we're all built in and it's mostly infill building. And therefore, the architects have generally become more introverted, more concerned with interiors. And if we don't need to have a famous architect to have a great piece of architecture, but there's usually one when you scratch the surface. In this special episode of Diggs TV, we look at the state of fine architecture today from three very different perspectives, architects, homeowners, and agents. First, we swing by a multi-million dollar Malibu mansion by the sea. I am here with Ari Akshar, founding realtor at Compass here in Los Angeles. What is very different to you about this home? Well, I think that there's many things. First off, you have a lot of architectural angles and features. It's a village of forms. and. You know, you, you just look at this and you can tell that when they built this, every element, every aspect really just came from their heart. And it was just a great vision from beginning all the way to execution. What are the features that you would tout or that you think are particularly exemplary even in this category of home? You've got the fact that you're sitting right on the ocean as your backyard. You've got a home that's made of steel and concrete, fireproof, earthquake proof, all of the angles. Uh, the soaring ceilings, you've got all the acoustical features. When you think about being able to go to or come to a home like this, which can be used as, as a sanctuary, and go to each and every single room of the home, it, it, it almost has its own character. This project was completed in 2010. I know there was a, about six year build out. Now that it's in your rear view mirror, what do you personally just love about it? What just makes you smile? Well, what makes me smile is the fact that the clients enjoy it because primarily I had a client that didn't want to live in the past. He wanted to investigate where he thought he was going. I told him I'm Chinese. I was born in Taiwan. I want to follow the feng shui. He says, what do you mean feng shui? Uh, well, it's a Chinese superstition or you can say tradition. And Chinese tradition, we emphasize on two words called feng shui. Feng means wind, shui means water. So in Western interpretation, I personally interpret it as Feng means ventilation. Sui mm. means floor. But there's something intimate and warm about this house, which one wouldn't immediately say thinking of steel and glass. Warmth is, a, is obviously a very difficult word to, to identify in terms of three-dimensional form. But the colors are cool because there is so much color coming from the ocean and from paintings, drawings, art, that I, I don't want the structure of the color to compete with that. Next, we move to the Caver Hill residence, a modernist architectural gem designed by famed LA architect Zoltan Pali. So how is it that you came about living here? I had a house here uh, back in 1998 that was about a third of the size. And it started with, there wasn't, quite enough closet space. Mm -hmm. No kidding. A time-worn tale for yeah, a Exactly. And I would ask people to come out and look and uh -huh. they would say, you don't qualify. Nobody wanted to take on the uh, the assignment of just a, you know, a paltry closet, ah. right? So one day, Architectural Digest, I saw uh, Zoltan Pauli, the architect's mm -hmm. home on um, Stone Canyon Road. He came out mm -hmm. and we started talking. I didn't know what to expect. I know that Zoltan um, has a good body of work. I wasn't prepared for the resolution of the house where every side of the house was completely resolved as sculpture. Inside and outside, they make a statement that's quite unique. And uh, the way it relates to the outdoors, I think, expresses the perfect California lifestyle. The fenestration is the way the glass is organized with the house. And when we look at the fenestration of the house, we see a rhythm 
and a balance to the whole statement. When we're looking out here, why it feels so natural. Even though this house is more of the Greek type of temple on top of a hill, rather than the Zen bungalow within nature, uh, it still relates to nature, and that's the key. What is the most inspiring thing about living here? The view. When you walk in, the house disappears and you float. It's really where the light works at that time of day. In the morning, there's one spot. In the middle of the day, another. Uh, at the end of the day, yet another. I just sort of circulate around where the light is really neat. Zoltan Pali is so well known in Los Angeles. He's done the Getty Villa and he's done the Wallace Annenberg Center for the Arts. Right. And did you ever think that you would own a piece of art? Gosh, no. no never. Okay. Uh, it didn't happen in that way when, um, you know, I, I sort of stood there and he handed me the Mona Lisa. So he didn't want to show me, but he had this little three by five inch piece of paper that you write like notes on, and he had drawn an outline for the, the shape of the house. And he kind of kicked it like this out from under his papers. When I saw it, I saw just the shape of it, and I, I knew he nailed it. Now we head to Silver Lake for a fireside chat with architect Dion Neutra. You have very generously led us into your home, and of course, it's your last name is Neutra, so this is just not an ordinary home. It is the Neutra Reunion Home. Yes, this house was designed in 1950 by the office for a young man who came from Chicago and claimed to have consulted with Frank Lloyd Wright. He wanted to be a builder of a modernist building. Mr. Wright told him, it's in the winter time here, we don't build in the winter, why don't you go to Southern California and check out with Richard Neutra, maybe he could design a house, you could build that and then come back in the summer and we'll talk again. We found this lot and so we decided this is a good spot to build, it's not a few uh, blocks away from our office. So we decided to um, program what could be the uh, user of this project, we can't design in the abstract. So we decided it would be a retired couple. It would have minimum landscaping, uh, very easy to take care of. And it might be designed in such a way that the older couple could be at one end of the house. At the other end of the house, we have a couple of spaces that their kids could come to visit, and we'll call it the reunion house. How would you sum up the Neutra building philosophy, starting with your father? We've always come from the premise that man should be in relationship to nature. Why? Because that's where we came from. We grew up in nature. For the first million years, that's where we were. We didn't even have a roof over our head for a long time. In fact, if you talk to people who work in windowless environments, they are very uncomfortable. They don't understand why, but it turns out we need the movement of the sun through the heavens, changes in the clouds, and all those kind of dynamic things happening. Well, otherwise, we feel uh, estranged. You can't express it in words, but it, it shows up in how you feel. And so, it's not about style or anything, it's more about using lots of glass and trying to create an environment, an interior environment, which enables you to commune with nature. What to do with these works of art? Let's talk restoration and preservation. What is your opinion on the current state of restoration and preserving these works of art? Well, I think over the last 40 years, that the idea of preservation has grown with the concept that these properties are works of art. They have their own value as art value rather than just a real estate value per square foot. More and more of the properties are pres preserved. Still, we lose from year to year important historic monuments. Well, you know, it's like you're having your own babies being attacked. I mean, every one of these projects has a personal connection. We work really hard on them to see them uh, either torn down, despoiled, or abandoned, or whatever hurts. So I've come up, for example, with a system that we put on title for the Neutra office building, which is where our plans were drawn, which would um, protect that building and prevent it from being changed without consultation. The main thing is, if you want to make a change, you have to consult. And the people you consult are concerned with the preservation of the building. 
and they are not going to permit anything unless it's in, in concert and in harmony with the original design. And that's the culture of our country in the United States. I buy the building, I get to do whatever I want to, and I'm a free, free world. That is not the case in most other parts of the world, but it is true here, and therefore, since most of our work is here, I watch one after the other of these buildings being despoiled while I'm alive. While my father was alive, he only saw that happen twice in his whole career. With me, it's nothing. Every week is another one I hear about. So that's the difference between our careers. I was just at a house that I did 22 years ago. Uh, it was the happiest thing in the world to go up there and see that they've kept the place up, that it's a beautiful thing. It's like owning an old Porsche, and you see it 25 years later, and it's still been kept up, and it's still beautiful. There is a, a recurrence that, that an architect has as a gift. That gift is seeing something that you've created that, that still has a life to it. Now you mentioned something with restoration. Now this, I imagine this is such a minefield and perhaps you could do something incorrect that, that takes away from the magic. As the first step, I would always um, recommend to my clients that they seek the, the counsel of an architect themselves. There are certain pieces that are so iconic that they probably shouldn't be touched. Oftentimes, even with Frank Lloyd Wright, I've seen Eric Wright come in and make improvements to kitchens where that timelessness is still present within the house. That's wonderful. It's a very sensitive line and very difficult to achieve, but one that's important because we want these houses to live as well. Next, how to ensure these pieces of art live on for generations to come. How do you cast the net? How do you connect a piece of art like this with the perfect buyer? You know, when you are looking at a home of the size of this magnitude that is created in the way in which it, it was, you have to find the buyer that understands the process as well and can appreciate it. It's usually a matter of patience. Each property is totally unique. It was com commissioned for an individual who had their own specific needs. It wasn't part of a cookie cutter mold. A buyer for this is going to view this as a true piece of art, like one that you would go and find at an auction house and there's no one winning solution for that. You've got to come up with multiple solutions and I think that the best way to do that is to align yourself with the best of all worlds. One of the best architects out there, the best company in Compass and a great agent. So the discoverability, being able to show the home in the light, being able to add the element of doing editorial photo shoots, giving the extra thought process to it are some of the ways in which the right buyer will be more attracted to this home and, and come to find it a lot easier. That's the theory. They have to be properly marketed and the people have to be understanding and all too often they're not. They're worried about what the real estate person says and who wants to get a quick sale. They don't want to waste time. So they'll take anybody who comes and they don't put too many limitations on the people. I would prefer to wait a little bit and find the right buyer, and I maintain that that buyer would pay a premium, maybe even more than the asking price. The house to me is more than a home. The house to me is a piece of art that you live within.